Hi, uh, so I'm gonna talk about making uh, on-demand grocery delivery profitable at Instacart uh, and the role that data and data science is playing in that. So Instacart's value proposition is very straightforward. We deliver groceries from stores you already know and love right to your doorstep, and it's in as little as an hour. So that's what Instacart does. Curious, how many of you use Instacart here? Yes, yeah, so maybe, maybe a quarter, okay. So really it starts on the consumer side uh, in the app. Uh, you log into Instacart, and the first thing that you do is you see a panel of stores that are nearby you that you can choose from. So you pick one of those stores, and then go into the inventory that's available at that store and start to shop for your groceries. Once you've selected everything, you decide to check out. You pick a delivery window uh, in order to get your groceries, in this case, delivered between 3 and 4 p.m. And then the shopper brings them to your doorstep. And you take all of the groceries out, you put them into your pantry, and then your pet crawls into the bag. And you take a picture of the pet. You put that on Twitter, and then you become famous. So that's actually the full Instacart experience. So you have to, you have to do that last part. But you know, this is interesting in and of itself, but I think what makes Instacart really interesting is what happens on the other side. So if I'm a shopper, uh, I have an app dedicated to me as a shopper, and I'm on a shift, and I am assigned an order. I acknowledge that order, I drive to the store, I start shopping for all of the groceries that that consumer wants. As I find them, I go up to the item and I scan the UPC code, and it tells me if I've picked the wrong version of yogurt, which I'm pretty bad at doing. Uh, and I just keep scanning them until I find the right one. Uh, and so it's a really straightforward process to pick the groceries. Then you check out, uh, go out and deliver the groceries to the consumer, and then the whole process with pets, that happens again. So what's interesting about Instacart is that it is uh, really a four-sided marketplace. There's the two obvious sides. You've got the customers on one side and the shoppers on the other. But you've got two other components. One of them is the stores themselves. All of these retail partners, we have hundreds of partners now, where the shoppers are going and they're actually shopping. We're reconfiguring the stores in some ways to let the shopping be easier and faster. And then also the customers, they have loyalty to specific brands. Um, and you know, they have to be able to find the inventory at that store location. And then there's the other side, which is the products themselves. Uh, the shoppers are picking the products, and then obviously the consumers are searching for them. And all of the consumer packaged goods companies want to advertise back to the customers. So it's a pretty complicated set of interactions, and there's data being tracked everywhere, and a lot of fun data science problems across the entire four-sided marketplace. But what I want to talk about today is can Instacart be successful? And in order to be successful, we need three things. First, a big market. Well, it's a $600 billion market for groceries in the US alone. So, you know, check, that's pretty straightforward. We need a product that customers love. And customers definitely love Instacart. It's something that they start to use over and over and over again. And so we get a lot of really lovely tweets from customers. But then we have to make money. Uh, and so the question is, can we do that? Can we have a good unit economics doing this business, or is Instacart going to be another web van? So let's talk about how we make money. There's four things that happen above the line. We charge a delivery fee or an express membership fee to the customer. The tips are collected, those go to the shoppers. We have product partnerships with consumer packaged goods companies. They pay us to do advertising or coupons. And then we have our retail partnerships and they pay us as well. So those are all of the revenue streams coming in, and then on the bottom side, we have to pay things like you know, transaction fees and insurance costs, and then we have the shopping time and the driving time. And it turns out that the shopping time and the driving time are what's really critical for success. You have to enable the shoppers to move very, very quickly in order for this to make sense. So that's something we focused a tremendous amount uh, on, and we've achieved profitable unit economics. It happened uh, in the summer. And you can see in this chart, as a percentage of the total time it took us to do a delivery at the peak, how far we've come in reducing the time to do a delivery. Uh, and uh, we're continuing to set aggressive goals and reduce the time. Last week, uh, Purva, our CEO, talked at TechCrunch Disrupt. And just to give you a couple of other stats, since the beginning of last year, we've grown revenue 500%. 90% of our customers are repeat customers. They spend about $500 a month with us. And in the next 12 months, we're gonna be a profitable company, cash flow positive. 
So what are the data science challenges? One is the marketplace itself. Everything is just more complicated. When you've got four different entities participating in your transactions, you know, they're all sources of data, sources of complexity. The second one is variance. It turns out that I spend a lot more of my time thinking about variance than I do the mean. You know, the reason is we have to contend with things like weather events or the Pope visiting. So as we saw the Pope visit all the different cities in the United States, they wreaked havoc on you know, infrastructure uh, and our ability to deliver on time. And then we also have obvious things like traffic patterns. The last piece that's really tough is the time. We're trying to do a delivery in an hour. And it turns out that that is just radically more difficult than trying to do a delivery in 24 hours like most of the traditional businesses. We have to pick all of the items in the order. We have to stand in the checkout line. We have to park the car at the delivery location and at the store. Sometimes we actually park our cars underneath other cars in order to get our deliveries in on time. So I want to talk about some of the science behind this. Uh, there's two pieces, uh, balancing supply and demand on one side, and then optimizing fulfillment. So the first piece is just measuring demand. It's not as easy as just looking at visitors coming to the site, because every time a visitor comes, they're gonna see delivery windows, some of which might be blocked off because we don't have enough shoppers, or there might be surge pricing that's increasing the prices of those windows. So when a customer comes, they could either check out, they could have intended to check out, but they walk away because of the delivery options that we've shown them. Or they never had any interest to begin with. And it's really important for us that we measure uh, how many of these visitors checked out and also were potentially lost. And so this is a time series of that, and we're building models to predict for every visitor what's the chance they would convert had they seen 100% availability of all of the delivery windows. Once we have that, we have to forecast it into the future. You know, this is a time series of a bunch of different regional growth uh, trends. If you zoom into one, you know, this is what's happening at one of our retail partners. If you zoom into that, this is what's happening across days of the week and then down to hours of the day. So we need to know this actually to the specific store location because we've got to put shoppers there. So we have to make many, many millions of forecasts. One of the biggest challenges is dealing with all of the outliers. There are the obvious things that you can see here which are flagged in red across the left-hand side or different geographic regions, and then time is on the x-axis. And so you see the big red stripes are the holidays. Those are always outliers. But there are also things like storms that affect a bunch of different regions simultaneously, and then random regional events. So increasingly, we're looking out you know, four weeks, six weeks into the future and trying to flag all of the potential regional events and adjust for them. Then we have to design the algorithm for forecasting demand, and so we go back in time, we look at all of the different regions, we select days on which to test multiple different algorithms, and then evaluate them and plot their performance over time. Um, and you can see here, the time on the left-hand side where there's the large bump is around the holidays, where demand is just much, much more volatile. Uh, there's a lot of things that are happening that are changing uh, both the supply and demand sides in the holidays, but then it's leveled out some since, and there are some of these algorithms that are winning over others, but it never really goes to zero. And in fact, as you look at larger markets, there's still, even in our largest markets, a significant amount of unpredictability about them. So we have to create demand shock absorbers. And this is a screenshot of the system we look at, uh, say our regional manager would look at, uh, for a bunch of different stores in San Francisco. Uh, and for each of these stores, we've got different delivery windows in the future. This is a, a view from last week. Uh, and you can see four different color codes. So what we've actually done, oops, I think I just went backwards. What we've actually done is estimated how much capacity we have to accept orders at each one of these delivery locations. Uh, and then we'll flag them as green if we feel like we have plenty of capacity. They turn yellow at a certain point as capacity starts to, to drop. And we start to increase the prices that customers would pay through busy pricing. Uh, and then eventually they'll, they'll go red uh, meaning that we've got you know, no availability left. Uh, and we're increasingly testing, uh, reversing it, and actually giving discounts when we have a lot of capacity to try to incentivize demand to times when we have lots of shoppers available. So now let's talk about fulfilling the orders once we've predicted the demand and we've set the shoppers and they're in their locations. The first thing is that delivering orders on time really matters. And so here I just show three different uh, types of deliveries. We're either on time within, say, an hour window, we're late some number of minutes or we're early some number of minutes. And shoppers, I mean, consumers definitely hate it when we're late, they get angry. But it turns out that they're actually pretty unhappy if we hit the window but or in the last five or even the last 10 minutes. You know, there's the expectation that we should get there in the middle of the window or early in the window. Uh, and it's okay if we're actually even earlier than that. So it becomes very important 
for every shopper, every trip, every type of activity they're doing to estimate how long is it going to take them to do that uh, and what's the variance in that. Um, and this is just a comparison. If you look on the left, it's uh, Google Maps travel time on the x-axis uh, for our drivers in Manhattan compared to on the y-axis is the actual delivery time. It's on a log-log scale. And so if you just take the predictions out of Google Maps API, you'll be able to explain about 25% of the variance. Um, if you look at the models that we've built internally that use a lot more of our historical data, we can get up to about 50% of the variance explained. Once we have these predictions, we have to route the shoppers. This is a real batch. Uh, we call multiple deliveries done together by one shopper a batch uh, from last week. We've got four different deliveries, and you can see the picking times where an individual shopper in the store who just picks groceries uh, was spending time finding all of the items and then staging them for delivery. And for each of those orders, there are these different blue delivery windows in the future that we have to hit. We then give that batch to one driver, and we assigned it before the third delivery was even finished being picking. So we told the driver they needed to go to the store. You can see in the green, they actually drove to the store. They spent some time in the store trying to find all of the bags, making sure they had them, scanning them, getting them back to their car. They then delivered the first delivery, the second, the third, and the fourth. Uh, and it turned out that all of these deliveries were on time. So it would be great if all we had to do was solve this problem of you know, which sequence do you take in order to deliver these four deliveries. Uh, all we need then is the predictions that we talked about earlier. Uh, there we're using things like gradient boosting machines and taking pretty complex time and space features into account. Uh, we do quantile regression to actually understand the distribution of outcomes rather than just the mean. Um, but we have to scale it to what turns out to be millions of predictions per minute. Uh, because we have to look at the combination of all of the shoppers, all of the orders, uh, and the sequence with which the shoppers might go in to decide what batches to create. So that is called the VRPTW problem. The longer the acronym, I think the harder the problem is to solve. Uh, and it's the vehicle route planning with time windows. Um, we've got thousands of deliveries to do, in this case, say 300. We are gonna, on average, do three orders per trip. Take uh, 300, choose three, multiply by 100, you've got 445 million combinations to evaluate. Uh, and unfortunately, this is constantly changing. So the plan that we create is gonna grow stale in a matter of five or 10 minutes. So this is something that we have to look at and try to solve constantly. We wanna uh, solve for three objectives. We wanna maximize the number of items found, which is going to depend upon what store location we choose to fulfill from. We wanna maximize the probability of de delivering uh, all of these on time. And then we wanna minimize just the total time spent delivering. So it's an incredibly difficult problem and we really started with very greedy, simple heuristics. Uh, we study them carefully, we try to make incremental improvements. We wait to the very last minute to dispatch. Uh, that way we capitalize on all of the information that we have about whether or not the shopper's location has changed or we've got new orders. We recompute our plans every minute in every one of our markets. And a few of the things that we've been doing that have really helped, one is to remove all of the constraints. Oftentimes you start out with a system like this, and because it's such a huge space to explore, you put in a lot of really coarse constraints up front. You know, don't do this if X, right? Most of those constraints um, are reasonable, but bad 10% of the time. And you pile up enough of them, you really constrain your entire optimization. So instead of having constraints, we try to unify all of these objectives into one objective function and have as few constraints as possible. And then we've begun to take different parts of the problem and break them apart. How do you come up with the optimal set of batches separate from how do you optimally route shoppers through those batches given you have them? Those problems turn out to be simple enough that we can actually use uh, algorithms to solve them completely. Uh, and we can, in some cases, put them into production, in other cases, study them to make the online system uh, more intelligent. So that's uh, data science at Instacart on the logistics side. Uh, we're hiring. You can find me on Twitter at Jeremy Stan. You can reach out to me via email at jeremy.stanley at instacart.com. Thanks.
Thanks very much, super interesting. Um, so speaking of, of team, uh, tell us maybe what, what the data science group uh, looks yeah. like at yeah. Instacart. So engineering is around, um, say, 100 people. Out of that, there's about 25 that are data related. About five are data engineering. About 10 are analytics, which is really decision science, helping to inform the decisions that the product managers or operations teams are making. And then there's 10 that are data scientists. Those data scientists are integrated into the product teams. Uh, so we have data scientists integrated into the availability team, the fulfillment team, the search and discovery team, uh, the consumer growth team. Uh, they work side by side with their engineering peers and the whole team owns the, the data science and the product and its evolution yeah, and that, the success of it. That's very interesting because one of the themes that has emerged over all the conversations we've had over the, the months is precisely the, the, the problem of having data scientists uh, sort of in an ivory tower somewhere in the organization, but you guys have chosen to, to build them into functional groups. That's right, and in some cases, data scientists have grown into the leaders of those teams, managing both engineers and data scientists. That's happened to two of our data scientists. Um, so there's lots of career growth advantages to it, uh, but I think ultimately it, it optimizes for getting things done. You don't, you're there when the product decisions are being made, when the logging decisions are being made. Uh, so you're up there up front helping to shape what's happening around you. And then you're there when the product is implemented and the changes don't work and the A-B test isn't successful and you're iterating and learning and kind of continuing to evolve with it. So I think that's incredibly important for success. Yeah, that's super interesting as a trend, right? Like if you think back, so 10 years ago, it was the salespeople were, uh, you know, controlling the company and becoming CEOs. Then it was the engineer, uh, the technical founder that had a chance to become a CEO. Then the trend over the last couple of years was very much the emergence of designers who then became CEO and founders. It'd be interesting to see if, uh, you know, to your point about data scientists becoming the leaders of those teams, whether being a data scientist becomes a path to be a startup CEO. Perhaps, or perhaps more startup CEOs uh, act uh, and think like data scientists. Yeah, great. And so so last question from me, and then we'll see if we have uh, some some in the audience. Um, tell us a bit about the, I guess, the stack. What what you know, what uh, infrastructure you ha you guys have, and what tools you use specifically in uh, yeah. data science. Yeah. So all of our production data is in Postgres, and we will read from the secondaries in AWS. Um, we push all of the Postgres data into Redshift uh, and do a lot of more intensive batch computations off of Redshift. Uh, the data science teams are using either Python or R. Uh, we do run R in production, you know, not for um, super high frequency uh, critical systems, but things that maybe batch every hour or even every minute. Um, we use Spark uh, when we have to, uh, try to stay away from having to use those systems as long as we can. And why is that? Uh, largely the additional complexity. If, uh, if for example, our, our fulfillment algorithm is already implemented in Python, everything's operating in Python, it's a lot simpler, and if you're doing things at the kind of uh, scale of complexity computationally that we're doing, uh, it makes more sense to keep everything co-located in one language, one runtime. Very good. Do we have uh, questions? One here, so we should have people somewhere with microphones. Oh, yes, okay, well, we'll, we'll come to this gentleman right after. Yes, hello. Um, shop, shopping in New York is a real challenge. Is, is there? Oh, there you go, okay. Hi. Yeah, shopping in New York is a real challenge. Yeah. So when I heard you say 60 minutes from order to delivery, I thought about that. And I said, have you tested shoppers, particularly people who know the stores, uh, being separate from drivers? Yeah, so in fact, the, one of the examples that I gave of a batch, the yellow shopping parts were four different people. Uh, each picking the groceries, and they're what we call in-store shoppers, and they just pick the groceries, you know, order after order after order. And so yesterday I was at the Upper West Side uh, Whole Foods, and I spent a couple of hours shopping, I spent time with the shift leads. Uh, they build up a really intense understanding of the store's layout, where the long tail items are, you know, where the end caps move as the store rotates them. Uh, and they have the ability to go back and check stock in the back room through their shift lead. So having that specialization of labor is really important. The painful part is it creates a queue for every store location of labor. Uh, and that means that they can sit idle if, uh, if there's not a sufficient amount of demand. Um, so that's a challenge. Great, thank you. There was one question. Oh, you, yeah. yeah, hi. Uh, is the unit economics optimization, is that? Spread. 
Okay. Using solving, uh, you know, one-to-one -one deliveries, or is there a, a plan, or you already do sort of solving for one-to-n, and then getting more efficiencies out of that as well? Well, yeah. So we do uh, batch deliveries together, uh, and so we'll do a lot of doubles, uh, triples, even quad deliveries, and you get to amortize the delivery, the driving and delivery time over all of those deliveries. And that's still within the same time constraint. It, it is. Uh, now, keep in mind that consumers can, can select windows into the future. And so it could be that we have a one-hour window, a two-hour window, a scheduled delivery, all that happen at the same time and space. Uh, and that creates uh, the great opportunity to do a, a triple. So it's nice at Instacart you get to talk about unifying time and space and not, you know, not in a pretentious way. Uh, hi, you made a decision to let the shopper choose the store and not their groceries. Is there a reason for that? Like, ah, yeah, why are we a storefront instead of a product marketplace? So it's a couple of reasons. One is the stores have uh, oftentimes a lot of unique inventory. You know, there's a lot of Whole Foods or uh, Fairway products that aren't available anywhere else. Uh, and if we were to uh, allow you to pick items from multiple different stores, uh, we wouldn't be able to fulfill them all from the same location. We would have to now go to, instead of the one to N, it becomes N to one, which really hurts the other direction. Um, and then finally, the, the stores and the retailers, they're really close partners to us. We help them build their brands. Um, and so it's valuable to them that customers come and they shop at Fairway on Instacart. They don't just buy Fairway's items on Instacart. Great, I'll take just one last question from the lady over there. Um, yeah. Hey, uh, can you talk a little bit about how um, data science came about within the startup process, like whether it was involved in, in the beginning or was it more product design to start with and then it came in more as you progressed? Yeah, great question. So the very first uh, engineer who was hired at Instacart, and keep in mind that one of the founders is an engineer, another one is a product uh, person, actually two of the founders are engineers and one is, one is product. Um, but the very first engineer hired outside of the founders leads the logistics team today uh, and isn't a data scientist, but uh, has a lot of the appreciation of what data science can do and how it does it and what it needs uh, and how to tool for it. Uh, and so very early on, he was making good product decisions, good infrastructure decisions, you know, implementing good heuristics. Uh, and the first real data scientist wasn't hired at Instacart, I think, for maybe a year, year and a half. You know, the, you can, basically my advice is not to start a startup with a data scientist. You know, focus on getting to MVP, getting some traction, generating some real data, uh, make good decisions early on, and then hire data scientists as you scale. Very good, on that note, thank you very much. Yeah. It was terrific. Thank you.